exactly is Move On? Move On is a grassroots campaigning organization that fights for social justice. We advocate across a variety of social justice issues. We support progressive policies. And typically in election years, we also endorse a slate of progressive candidates. But Move On is really a community of millions of Americans who identify as progressive in all 50 states. We're also a small, scrappy, fully distributed team. We've all been working remotely for the last 10 plus years and we're embedded in the grassroots communities that make up America. This allows us to run nationally impactful programs and to be able to achieve that national scale, all of these programs are powered by tech tools and data. To make this happen, we have a complex ecosystem of 30 plus websites and tools that all work together to, and need to scale on a nonprofit budget. So who am I? I'm MoveOn's Chief Technology Officer. I've been at MoveOn since 2015, and I've been in tech for uh, more than 15 years, working at a variety of Fortune 500 companies, startups, consulting companies. And as I've progressed in my tech career, I've deepened my expertise in distributed system scaling, and I'm really excited about using those skills to build tech that powers collective action. So today we're gonna talk about the new attention economy, how we get our information online and where we get it from. I'd like to tell you a story about a huge protest we pulled off in 2018 that was deeply affected by our place in the attention economy. Then we'll get into all the systems, tools, and architecture that makes this all possible and how we managed to scale on a nonprofit budget. So show of hands, who remembers Slashdot? Yeah? Who remembers the internet before big social media? The rest of you can get off my lawn. So let's talk about the slash dot effect. This was a nerdy nickname for a website scaling events in the late 90s. And it's when a website with significantly more engagement and viewership links to a smaller website with less viewership and the resulting fire hose of web traffic can often take the smaller website down. And this is a classic late 90s graph to go with a classic late 90s nickname. This is sort of like a baby picture for internet scaling. Today we live in a more complicated kind of internet. As the total amount of information to consume has steadily grown over the last few years, the amount of human attention available to consume all this information, even when we're psychologically incentivized to consume as much as possible, this attention has become a real limit. And content publishers have evolved into deeply personalized content ecosystems driven by algorithmic feedback loops. And I'm talking about the social media platforms here and what you see in your feed. These social media platforms all compete for our eyeballs and they wanna control what we see based on behavior they wanna drive, which is usually more clicks. So previously the internet was more spread out. Many content creators, many content publishers, and amplification was a job owned by viewers and readers. But today we have just a few dominant content publishers who not only control what we see and when we're using their platforms, but they also control the shape and characteristics of engagement. Because of algorithmic feedback loops involved in customizing our content feeds and incentivizing particular types of engagement, typically social media platforms are always optimizing for more clicks. And so they end up amplifying highly inflammatory content, like basically everything that's happened so far in 2020. And they do this directly and also via behavioral feedback loops. As you may have noticed, either from your pile of bills or giant pile of money in your backyard, if you've been lucky, Americans now live in an economic oligarchy but we participate daily in another kind of oligarchy, a social media oligarchy. So not only do we get most of our information from deeply personalized social media platforms, we often get most of our social media content directly or indirectly from the people on these platforms that have the most reach. And this follows an oligarchic pattern. So 0.1% of users have the majority of followers, more than 100,000 typically, and then there's a tier of folks below that uh, representing about 2% of social media users that have 10 to 100,000 followers. And then everyone else, including myself, has maybe 500, 700 followers or less. So social media is an oligarchy too. We call these social media users with huge follower counts and reach influencers. Influencers with a capital I are people with more than 100,000 followers. And then micro-influencers are social media users with 10 to 100,000 followers. These influencers control the nature of virality in today's uh, attention economy. They're also the only thing that's more powerful right now than the social media algorithmic feedback loops. 
I don't know what to say about this other than I am not an influencer on Twitter, so you all can get off my lawn. So I want to tell you a story about a moment that in the progressive movement we're all really proud of, and it's also a story about the influencer economy. In 2018, Move On and a handful of other organizations banded together and created a coalition called No One is Above the Law to protect the ongoing Mueller investigation from tampering or being undermined. As a part of this, red lines were identified. These are actions that if the Trump administration took them, we'd immediately protest in response. And by we, I mean hundreds of thousands of people. By November 2018, over 500,000 people had pledged to protest if any red lines were crossed. And through the summer, the threat of mass protests appeared to be keeping various risks to the Mueller investigation at bay via the threat of collective action. But then the day after the election, Trump does cross a red line by firing Jeff Sessions and replacing him with a loyalist. So this coalition had an emergency meeting about an hour after this happened and decided to launch these Trump is not above the law protest network. So a few hours later, we launched the protest network and we released posts and call to actions on all of our social media pages and we email our list and broadcast to all, everyone who subscribed to our SMS list. And we see on social media a little bit of a lift, mostly from our own micro-influencers, of tens of thousands of retweets and the website itself <clears throat> observed moderate surges of traffic. But a few hours later, when our favorite influencer, Rachel Maddow, mentioned the protest website on her evening show, we saw a traffic surge up to three and a half million views all of a sudden, just in minutes, which made our site fell over, but we quickly brought it back up. Here you can see our Google Analytics graph of the, our Rachel Maddow moment. But we were able to capture most of that influencer energy and attention after we quickly brought our website back up and we converted it into even more protest events and RSVPs. By the end of the day, we now had a thousand events, protest events scheduled na nationwide and over 500,000 people had RSVP'd to these events. That's an additional 300 events and 100,000 more RSVPs in just 24 hours, most of that due to the Rachel Maddow mention. And then at the end of the day, we had nationwide protests. And here you can see some beautiful pictures of people protesting all around the nation in big cities and small towns, uh, it's just so much incredible solidarity and show of collective power. Getting back to the subject of lawns, I was at my local Charlottesville, Virginia protest, and the city of Charlottesville literally told the protesters during this protest to get off the county office building's lawn. So we had to stretch around the, the sidewalk uh, around that building instead, but this just made us look even more powerful. So look at all of this, look at all this beautiful collective action. The key technical takeaways from this protest event were, for me, were that the observed behavior of virality in, in the modern social media attention economy is tightly controlled by the social media platforms. Going viral only means a huge surge of traffic in the slash dot sense if the platforms decide it does. With major exception, influencers can still generate that organic viral behavior if you get their attention. So what do you think is involved in pulling off mass national protests? Turns out it's mostly logistics. Where do people go? Who is handling which tasks? How do you get hundreds of thousands of people to know about a thing or to do a thing? It's all about disseminating information at all the right times to guide and amplify this energy that's already there. So specifically for this protest and our protest infrastructure in general, we have a hub website so that's a server on top of a database managing events that lets you sign up to host events, sign up to RSVP to particular events, we usually have a map showing where all the events are and some search tools. Um, one key to scaling here is crowdsourced event creation. Anyone can host a protest and we have these rolling host prep and training calls after the website launches to make sure that all of the, pros, that all of the hosts have all the information they need to, to run a really great protest. Uh, but the, the vast majority of the technical complexity here is in the mobilization tools. So this, these are the, the buffet of ways where we try and meet people where they already are and try to find people who are already interested in attending a protest event. So we send emails, we send SMS messages, we do social media posts, we do targeted ad buys, anything we can do to try and find people who might be interested in attending a nearby protest. So to be able to step up to big moments like this, 
and to make our work and mission matter, we, we need to be able to turn around on a protest action very quickly and get all of the re related logistics in place in, in just days, sometimes even just a single day. So this in itself presents a series of technical challenges and we all have to pull them all off on a nonprofit budget. The problems to solve here are generally around timing. So you don't know when the protest is gonna launch. You don't know when a moment will happen that you need to organize a protest for, but you need to be able to carry out all the related preparation moments and technical scaling moments within just a few hours typically. And so some you know, big companies may just deal with issues like this by pre-scaling up 4X or 10X, but we can't afford to do that on a nonprofit budget. So, uh, and also our infrastructure is relatively complex. We use a variety of tools, especially when it comes to mobilization tools that are a combination of in-house and vendor dot tools. And this ecosystem itself presents its own emerging scaling challenges. Scale testing by itself is actually very complicated and time consuming. So how do we pull this off at all? The first and foremost, the most important thing is monitoring. So you need to monitor everything from your high level page level SLAs and clickstream click throughput all the way down to things like database CPU. And you need to monitor not just your systems, but vendor systems too. Setting SLAs across your stack for key workflows and identifying those key workflows ahead of time and critical failure points is key. And you should assume that for all of your most critical workflows and failure points, all the most important parts of your system will fail. And like Senator Warren, you should have a plan for that. Uh, so this is true in general, but especially true for scrappy nonprofits that have to exist in a vendor ecosystem that we can't control. Your system doesn't scale if your vendors don't scale. And the best way to make sure your vendors scale is to identify very specifically what scaling means and then write down your scaling needs in your contract and contractually bind your vendor to them. This can be difficult to pull off, especially if you're a small organization or you're working with relatively small scale vendors. So sometimes making this work involves uh, building a strong relationship, running a regular RFP process to make sure that vendors are competing. But the critical point is get these scaling SLAs as much as you can into your contract. So who has a cybersecurity incident response plan? Hopefully most folks in the audience do. Who has a scaling incident response plan? I see a couple of people raising your hands. So uh, this is a scaling incident response plan is a basically documentation and it's a description of what to do before, during and after a scaling incident, which thresholds to monitor, which thresholds are actionable, who to call, what to check, which decisions need to get made, who makes them, just a clear mapping out of a workflow that allows a system of computers and tools and humans and data to, to scale together. There should be just enough detail in your scaling response plan to ensure that everyone involved knows how to diagnose what's happening and knows what to do next. And a scaling incident response plan, of course, should include your systems and also your vendor systems. Even if you can't control them, you can control what action you take when they go down and roll out, roll out things like static backup sites or stop gaps solutions. It's important to get really granular with auto scaling. Probably most web architectures today are deployed to some sort of cloud system that comes with a variety of auto scaling levers at your disposal. For really fast turnaround work, it's important to get really, really granular with your auto scaling thresholds and actions. And that's down to the level of minutes for political work or anything related to the news cycle. So typically you only have 24 hours to put together a meaningful response. And if you aren't able to get it done in time, you basically just miss that moment and have no impact. There's also a, an action curve involved in most news related user behaviors. That's the amount of time between when a thing happens and people will find out about that thing. And then there's some percentage of them will, will take an action. It typically follows a bell curve. And uh, in, in most news or media related work, the bell curve is spread out over 24 or 48 hours. So we don't have hours to respond. And that means we can't miss 15 minutes even waiting for auto scaling to kick in. So our auto scaling thresholds have to be super granular and responsive down to the minute. Another way, depending on how your application is structured to make this work even better for you and, and work more cheaply is to consider using microservices for a small set of scaling bottlenecks. So it's always possible to throw more servers behind a CPU or memory bound website, but it's also possible, it, it's helpful to take your application 
into consideration and see which pieces of it could be abstracted out into microservices. Now, I'm not suggesting take your entire website and break it into 100 over-designed microservices, spend four years working on this, and then, you know, surprise, the cloud computing paradigms have changed out from under you. So not, don't microservice everything, but take a look at one or two scaling bottlenecks uh, and consider whether these could be abstracted out, potentially vendored out, or containerized out. Uh, this, this, in our experience, has driven down the cost of auto-scaling significantly for us um, because the per invocation cost of a microservice is typically well below the per hour cost of a virtual machine. And we were able to drive down our scaling costs to be 10% of what they were year over year uh, compared to the cost of scaling up dedicated hardware. Scaling response plans should also include all of the levers at your disposal as a distributed system. So many of us are already familiar with horizontally scaling web servers, but in most cloud computing ecosystems, while it's easy to add servers or additional containerized capacity, it's also possible to just in time upgrade the brain power of the hardware that you're using. So uh, typically scaling a huge amount of writes to a database is a hard problem, but the scaling uh, considerations for a database are usually that you are probably going to be CPU bound if your queries are computationally expensive, or if you're just doing a whole lot of writing, you're going to be bound at the network IO level. It's possible to just in time upgrade your, your database's network IO capacity or CPU as needed. So don't forget that is an option. Um, at the application level, it's also possible to add additional caching at a variety of different layers in between user behavior, front end, back end, and the database. This is a significant investment in developer time as debugging caching issues is notoriously difficult, but it is an option at your disposal. And if your system is bound by a fire hose of writes instead of reads, then you can also add a queue to your architecture or several queues, and that'll allow you to collect up bursts of writes to process in a way that you can control. And when considering distributed system scaling issues overall, it's important to pull back even further and remember the CAP theorem, which states that uh, you can only have two of consistency, availability, and tolerance network partitioning. Uh, and this is not a suggestion. This is a theorem proved by Na Nancy Lynch at MIT decades ago. So it's helpful to analyze your architecture as a whole ahead of any scaling incidents and map out the choices that you may be forced to make and the choices that you can make uh, in the event of a loss of data consistency, component availability, network partitioning, and be prepared to make hard choices Map this out and decide which hard choices you're willing to make. So in conclusion, the big social media companies have changed the shape of the attention economy, where we get our information, how we get it, uh, whose voices shout louder based on their reach and followership. Social media is a bit of an oligarchy right now. Influencers have the majority of the power. Because of the, the power of micro-influencers and algorithmic feedback loops, if your website is going to get a traffic surge, this is going to happen in minutes instead of hours, and so you need to be able to respond in minutes. The most important way of preparing yourself for being able to do this is to do scale planning and have scaling incident response plans. Scaling today is much harder than it used to be, but it's also very important. Monitor everything, create emergency response plans, and get really, really granular. Any questions?